a max of 80,000 in terms of relief. Yes. On that point also, so for moms, working moms, maybe I can share also. When you have working mother's child relief, if you have a few kids, you're a high income mom, mm. you will realize you'll hit the 80,000 tax relief very easily. Very quickly, yeah. Uh, and make sure again, you have transferred the child relief to your other half. So that's something to note. Go and do all this tidying up, especially when you're earning lesser, these weren't a problem, but now these are left on the table. So another tip, go check on your own taxes, see whether you can optimize with your other half. Uh, start by introducing yourself for everybody that don't know you. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Josh. I run two YouTube channels on finance. And actually a side story, I started doing YouTubing to really share more on investing and personal financial tips because my key work is in financial advisory. Hmm. So I meet customers, I want to acquire customers. And I thought hey, social media is a way to get to know people. And this journey has been four years. So now I run two YouTube channels, not only just to find customers, but really to educate each and everyone that can listen in and benefit a bit. So happy to be here, Reggie. Yeah, fi finally. I actually tried to cast you for a while. <laughs> <laughs> hiding. Uh, hiding. I was like, Josh, come lah. It's like, no lah. Your yeah. segment talk very long ah, Very tiring ah, right? So finally, finally you're yes, here. Yes, so we have so, to make it engaging so it doesn't seem very long. Of course, ah. of course. That's, that's what we have to do, right? So, so maybe for a start, right? Uh, I think your channel is the astute parent, right? Yes. So I want to ask, like, what's the definition? What is an astute parent? Hmm. Actually, you know, it's like finding a name for companies. Like giving a name to a kid. It's, mm. it's always hard. You want the name to embody everything good about it. So when I thought about finance channel, finance website, astute seems like, you know, savviness, mm. right? Very atas, ah, very astute, atas, this right? very atas, yes. And parent portion comes in because, you know, at the start, the advice is usually find a niche. Mm. Find a niche, put your foot there, and then you start to broaden. Mm. So that's why parenting is what I thought I would have a niche in. Mm. So of course, the journey, where, where we start is not, necessarily where we develop. I think that's also an important point to note also. Mm. And more nowadays, more I touch on investing, yeah. general personal financial tips rather than how to save money as a parent. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, fair. So so just for clarity's sake, mm. you have young kids. Oh, yes. You are the middle, uh, the sandwich generation. <laughs> You're the typical type of, that, you know, that profile, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I can understand the pains of raising a family. Hopefully that resonates with audiences mm. also. Because when we are walking the same journey, sometimes some of the, the things we go through are very unique. Mm. And when you hear from someone in the same position, you find that relief. Yeah. You're not alone. Yeah. Uh, there's some things you didn't think of and that makes your journey a bit better. Yeah, yeah. So so if people feel more connected, you know, with what you share. Hopefully. And, and, and all that jazz, right? Okay, okay. So like, let's let's start with like some of the, the big strokes, right? So what are some, you know, basics of being an astute parent, right? So so in, in that sense, in a sense to try to get ourselves into that whole like financial, you know, retirement or like planning, you know, like what are some basic blocks for, from your viewpoint? Because everybody mm. has you know, some some basic blocks, right? So since you're in studio, I ask you like, what are some basic blocks to your oh, financial planning I, strategy? I think everybody's starting point is different. Mm. So if you listening in today, you are at a starting part, you haven't invested before, then look for content that teaches you on how to get started correctly mm. rather than you bang the wall in the wrong direction or dabble in the wrong space. So I think each and every phase, you do it a bit differently. So if you're at a start, maybe being as is listening more first, slowing mm. down your process and in that you would avoid mistakes mm. can you expand a little bit more what does it mean by listening more slowing down your process oh, okay. because some... you can listen to a bunch of trash you see trash right <laughs> uh, true 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 <laughs> you know when we when we are on this learning curve or there's this theory i can't remember the name so at the start right when we learn something hey everything seems like, oh yeah it's a yeah, fantastic yeah, 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 idea yeah, yeah, yeah. i think yeah. it's dunning kruger effect or dunning something kruger, like that. yes yes, yes. you so, don't know what you don't know you don't know what you yeah, don't know yes. at the start everything was oh yeah you just picked it up i i mastered it already mm -hmm. And then you get overconfident too quickly and you just start, start to pour everything that you have to quickly make that leap. And then little do you know that actually you don't know that much mm -hmm. because what you have learned is only in a short span of time and only describing in, in finance or investing a particular market cycle. Mm -hmm. And then you assume that will reflect your entire 50 years ahead of investing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that comes about mistakes. You become overconfident. So I mentioned about slowing down. I think it's about realizing what you don't know. Mm -hmm. That will in turn give you that humility so how do I validate then? If I don't mm. know what I don't know and mm. I need to realize what I don't know, how do I know what I don't know? Well, uh, right. that's, that's, that's hard. Yeah. Maybe the best solution is to really uh, be very strict in terms of how much you can deploy. Mm. Like for example, you have an amount. If you're new, don't pour everything in after you've discovered things. Mm. Force yourself to space it up over years. 
at least that's from the investing front. Mm, space mm. it out, space it out, space it out. Force yourself to space it out. And then that's how you avoid mistakes. That's why you give yourself more time mm. to learn what you don't know. Because okay. it's only with time that you uncover. Time tested, right? Yes. Yeah, and try to connect with other people. You know, they have been there, done that, you know, exploring. Yes. That's, it's always a great place to kind of validate to others, right? And, yes. And yeah, I, I think it's great. It's great. You kind of do a little bit of that kind of risk management right mm. from the right from the get go right so mm. so in, if that's the case right you are a big proponent of DCA because there's always this divergent between like should I lump sum in if let's say today I have a hundred thousand I start <laughs> do I start lump sum or I already have this money but you should slowly drip it in like where are you on this uh, lump sum would seem fancy right yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. wow we Whoa! make a big swing a big sp- go, go splash guys. <laughs> but big swings maybe it's for you know the experience hand mm, mm, mm. if we were to simplify it so Again, if you are at the starting phase of a journey or not too experienced, maybe not starting but middle phase. Yeah, kind of. I think most of our audience are somewhere y- in the middle. Yes. You would benefit by mm. slowing down. Mm. You are not investing to be the world's most successful investor. You are <laughs> investing to get to financial freedom. Yeah. So once you understand your goal, you understand that you don't need to swing for fences, especially if you are still new and you DCA. You slow down that process. Great, great. I like I like that clarity. So what is then financial freedom to you? Financial freedom, you know, I did a recent video uh, accounting back on my, how much I've saved up, how much I've built up. Mm-hmm. I would encourage each, each and everyone to look at their own books because when you go through that audit process, you'll think back, hey, how much have I, what, what kind of mistakes I've made? What kind of things I've done correctly? And you realize that as you go along in this journey, you don't be too fixated. Oh, I need to reach financial freedom, die, die. Because that number would move forward. If you spend 3,000 a month, there's this formula, 25 times of annual income. If your expenses are 3,000, you will need 900,000 to be defined as financially free. Mm, mm. But then if you need 6,000 a month, you realize it's 1.8 million. Mm, mm. But again, do you really need 6,000? Mm. So the question regards that. So in, in essence, when you think about financial freedom, don't worry about too big a number. Go at a pace that you like. And again, understand that expenses can, can change, which will mean your financial freedom number can change. Mm-hmm. So, so in other words, to you, there is a definite number to constitute financial freedom and it's built on your monthly expenses. Yes, that will be the minimum. Okay. Your core expenses that you die, die will need to have. Mm-hmm. Then once you have that, then beyond that, you will know that you can you can change that amount, right? Yeah. A, yeah. a flight ticket, you can go with SQ or yeah, you can yeah, go yeah, with... Yeah. And, I, and I do think... Um, there's a little bit of this situation where Singaporeans, or at least a lot of Singaporeans that I talk to, they kind of put everything as your core, right? Everything is mm. important. Like traveling is important. Everything is important, right? Like all put together, mm. you know, but do you have some separation where like maybe your core, you really kind of dumb it down to be like, this is like basic. Like I really need this non-negotiable. And then there are all these other things that are more negotiable. Like is, do you have some texture there? I, th- I think the best feedback is actually with retirees. Mm. If you speak to retiree, you realize, they say, hey, actually, we don't need that much. I know, you youngsters yeah. think that yeah. you need that much yeah. because you're still drinking alcohol. I know, One I know. glass is $28 minimum. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Okay, I'm so going to do an open casting call here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you're tuning in or your parents, you know, are very opinionated, you know, and they would like to talk about it, you know, come on the show. We are hoping to do more of uh, talking to retirees so that we can kind of expound on their opacity, right? Because now it's very opaque, uh, mm. right? All the coverage around retirees is Merdeka generation, you know, mm. like they very chiala need help like that, right? Yes, so all correct. the, the, the correct. coverage is very negative, but but I think, you know, like, like what you said, right? Actually talk to a retiree, they, they do give you a little bit more clarity Correct. there. Yeah, so they would reflect what they've actually quite happily cut down on. And you realize that through these stories that a lot of things we build up in our working years, we are quite willing to give them up mm. and they'll reduce the expenses number. Can you give us some examples before we mm. get a retiree to come in? <laughs> you share some of the things that you would ha- happily cut off. I think in terms of dining, maybe that, that's an easy place very relatable place. Mm. When we are in our working years, we don't have time, we, we grab food in, we spend for convenience and service and stuff. And when you get the retiree phase, you're quite happy to walk mm. to find your favorite food because you have time. Mm. Mm. So your time is spent finding things you like and you need not pay for service. Mm. Every little bit counts. Mm. And you realize that true food, you can shave off 50%. Mm. And mm. that that snowball starts from there. You were talking about like, you did an audit mm. of yourself, right? So barring our audience going to your channel to watch it, which of course you should, <laughs> you know, like what, where, where are you now? Today at 39, you know, what is your audit? What are your numbers? You know, oh. like, just, just give us a bit of color. This whole exercise is to really see where I'm at also, as well as mistakes. Mm. So the end figure really doesn't 
matter too much. Mm -hmm. So don't hear the end figure and you get either annoyed or you get jealous or you think it's too little. Yeah. Don't go in that direction. So I, I'm, I'm kind of at this phase whereby I think it should be enough because as I mentioned, you can cut back down very easily. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, I'm just I'm still spending that can be cut back on. So I'm at this phase where I'm working for the next generation. A lot mm -hmm. of the motivation is not, oh, I have enough ready and chew. Mm -hmm. It's really to set an example to my kids. Can you build something? Daddy is working hard. Daddy has some and I'm not chilling because work ethic is what I want to impart to you. I can't be teaching work ethic and then I, I, I have enough that I'm playing games. Mm. Isn't that way? So I, I'm building is for the future and there should be enough ready. I'm not too worried about that. Okay, so what's the magic number? What's the magic number? Oh, what, now it's about 1.7 in net worth. Great. It's okay. It's yeah, okay. Yeah. That includes house also where you can't consume it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then that shows me uh, at least a, a direction, a mm. path. Mm. And where I can get to, I think I roughly have in mind. Mm. Uh, so mm. what are the steps? So a lot of times we think about numbers and we extrapolate indefinitely, mm. which is also not the case because you you have bumps, you have hiccups, but you need to make moves also when you're experienced enough to get the leap. And that's mm. why I've maybe shared before also, I've sold in my HDB flat, mm. which was rented out as a second property. And that is in itself a move that I plan to have changes in the coming years ahead. What other interesting moves that you're going to do? What, <laughs> one good move is to... <laughs> okay. It's good enough. Okay, okay. You're swinging too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. But, but fair. That, that in itself attracted a lot of criticism. Oh, why? Yeah, because most people think, hey, HDB, great. Well, you're clanking so much in mm. rent. Well, mm. Why mm. would you sell HDB flat to invest? Mm. Especially in Singapore markets where many deem it to be out of flavor, out of touch. Mm. You're much better at property prices mm. appreciating mm. as well as rental income. Mm. So that in itself is very contrary. In, mm. in approach and then what is the logic flow that mm. lead you to take this contrarian move okay so in terms of properties you would see that the cycle is very slow it goes up over a multi-year period it comes over a multi-year period most people who don't believe it will come down we should look back <laughs> as recent as 2013 2016 it was flat to down mm. but of course the Asian financial crisis is a major down mm. so you look back history you realize that nothing is invincible mm. and we understand that there are cycles to things Mm. So in each cycle, when it's a high cycle, what do you, what kind of brave decisions you need to make? Mm. Of course, not advice to go and sell away mm. whatever you have. But not, in my not opinion- Not the house position also. Ah. Ah, relax, relax. Ah, relax. Yes, yes. yes. Bye, bye. So bye. home don't sell. So yes. now again, that's rented out, which mm. means it's purely an investment decision. Mm. If I cash that out, what can I do with it? Mm. Uh, and a lot of the thought processes are regarding how to deploy the capital differently. Can we exit at a high? Oh, and also when I- when I uh, bought the flat, that was in 2011. The peak cycle was 2013, if you check in terms of HDB price trends. So after that, it started to come down. Yeah, it was lateral for a while. Correct. Mm -hmm. And mine is an older HDB flat, which means for, for a long period of time, uh, I bought mine at 373k, 373,000. And for a long period, my neighbors were trading around 300,000. Mm. And people say, oh, old flat, that's a confirm decay under zero. Mm -hmm. uh, also not true. Uh. Mm -hmm. So 300,000, I had to bite the bullet, hold on to it, and therefore exit in a high market. Right? Mm, mm. So a lot of times that goes back to investment principles. When the times are bad, can you hold on to it mm, mm. and not exit at the wrong time because there will be ups and downs. Okay. And uh, eventually when I deem it to be a high cycle, right or wrong, we don't know yet. I have to make calls and execute accordingly. So actually at 39 mm. with a net worth of 1.7, you know, actually a lot of people will be very happy to learn, uh, right? <laughs> to try to understand where, what what, what can I do mm. to be like a astute parent, mm. George, right? So maybe you can share with us a little bit. What are, the, what are your major principles looking back, mm. right? After the audit, like what are your major principles to get you to this point? I, I think the starting investing early, we've heard this cliche so many times. Yeah. And rather than debating on the power of compounding, which is mm. also mentioned to death already. Yeah, yeah. I would say that when you start early, you give yourself you give yourself a lot of time for mistakes. Mm. You make mistakes in your early years, you have many multi-cycles ahead. And that experience really gives you confidence to make big swings. Mm. So mm. anyone listening, if you're young, start start early, make the mistakes small amounts because the lesson is where you big, make big swings in your 30s. Mm. Mm. So now my big swing is to move out and buy into assets, which I think are distress are cheap and then go for the next cycle mm. in property markets when the time comes. So this journey has been quite long through investing and uh, gradually build it up. So then maybe you can share with us, mm. right? Like, so this is your current big swing move. Do you make any big swing move previously in your mm. in your 13 year journey? At one point, I actually managed to start an ice cream business. <laughs> ah, that itself is a story. But if I look back at the journey, 
I actually made some big swings doing trading and build up a bit of capital. So how to deploy capital? I make big swings to do an ice cream business, which failed. So that is a big swing that won, a big swing that lost. Mm. So that is a cycle itself. Six years ago, I paid ABSD to buy this private property yeah, without selling the HDB flat. So that in itself was a big decision to cough out the ABSD mm. and then to eventually move the family mm. to a different place. Okay. So okay. at every stage, we need to think, what was our next few years ahead? Mm. Think forward and plan your investments forward rather mm. than, oh, what's, your, what's the best way of return? Over the last five years, it's not. Mm. It's your own moves. Okay. Think about the next five years and make your moves. Okay. So you don't believe in the set and forget. Type set. Of, <laughs> broadly diversify, set and forget type of thing. You know, that's not your core ideas. That has strengths. Mm. That is backed by numbers currently. Car- <laughs> uh, I like that currently. It's backed by numbers currently. It's based on currently. the past 30 years data sets, right? Okay, Correct. Okay, okay. Uh, right now, refuting that would make me sound very <laughs> silly. <laughs> so I want to go that space. Uh, uh, but also understand where that marketing message comes from. Mm. And you decide for yourself whether that works or not. That has merits. But clearly that is using numbers that look favorable for that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then for clarity's sake, mm. right, you would argue that one of your first big bucket of capital was through trading. Mm. Right, that is your first because I think that is the first part that is quite hard for a lot of people, mm. especially you know like you work you know like a day job like day to day type of situation. If you're working professional, you know if you're very hang, you squeeze into a good sector, great, good on you, mm. right? But but for many other people, you know, uh, getting that first bucket is, is oh, I definitely don't advocate for trading because yeah, yeah, after yeah. that part, there's also losses mm-hmm. in trading itself. So mm. it doesn't mean that it's a permanent one directional gain. Great, great. So, great. but I, I'm more focused on that. That was a lesson that hey, if you mm. do this, there are lucky wins, they're big, but mm. after that, there are also big losses. Mm. So, is that the way to compound wealth or not? Mm. So that got me thinking also. Okay. Yeah, so trading, I'm not a fan of it simply because I tried that. And right now, I'm just investing for a long term. Okay. That okay. is the approach that I do. Whether it's real estate or whether it's in stocks, that is the, okay. the thing I believe in now. But you did make your first bucket from trading. Yes. Okay, yeah. Yes. yeah. Which is fine, right? Because oh, it's actually, just adding color. But that, that still comes with you. You start working early. You still start saving so. early. Okay, okay. Swings like that gives you that, that amount. Yeah. But again, what yeah. you do with it, was it lost subsequently? Can it be replicated over the next 10, 20 years? Mm. I think that's the harder question. Okay, okay, fair. And, and I think the replication part is important yes. because that is the basis of compounding, right? You Correct. must repeat and repeat and repeat. So sometimes you have a good win, you have a good year, you know, and then you cannot repeat this, right? Because it cycles down and all sorts of weird shit, right? Then it becomes very hard, It's right? like you, you, if you buy a lottery and you win, mm-hmm. okay, then you great, think, oh, you have you. a good sensing of yeah. where the numbers are. <laughs> but actually that is, hey, you uh, got uh, that lucky break. Mm, 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 then you rest, you can't replicate that yeah and uh, then that def- definitely is not a matter to grow well for it okay okay fair fair I, I agree right so just for uh clarity right because i think a lot of the discussion mm. was like investing investing mm. investing right? so i just want to get your assumption that is it a must to invest if you want to retire early absolutely mm. retiring early requires you to invest but actually the, the bigger question is is it a must to retire early? Oh, okay, that, that is a <laughs> not, different question. Not everybody needs to retire because there, there are sacrifices mm. to make in that journey. Mm. You need to be more thrifty than usual. You need to develop the investing part because that allows you to generate income. Retire means you, you need to have other sources of income, right? mm. correct? Because mm. your active income shrinks. Your investment income needs to go up. Whether you're in real estate or in, in investing into financial assets, you need to know that think very well to have mm. a good sensing mm, mm. so in itself investing is definitely must but retiring early maybe not think whether or maybe for parents also you would realize that expenses start to step up we want to invest in kids also and that's not expense to cut down unnecessarily mm. uh, it's going for holiday right now i buy four tickets <laughs> i know i know uh, so in, in itself uh, different segments might want to chase retiring early differently mm. and although we kind of put it on a pedestal Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not such a big deal after all. Mm. I understand what you're saying, right? Because I think recently there's a bit of a trend to reverse this like retire early <laughs> thing. Now people are like, oh, maybe there are different ways to look at this, blah, blah, mm. blah, right? So, so I, I kind of get it. And I like that you talk about the sacrifices because I think a lot of time it's too sensational. Mm. We don't realize that, okay. In other words, you're sacrificing the experiences now, right? You experience, mm. You're cutting at some level cutting back on like what you can do now, right? Hoping that you can expedite this process no, or, or not hoping, targeting to expedite this process and hoping that at the end, there's a rainbow at the end of the tunnel, right? Exactly. So at this point, maybe I can advocate, we should have kids. Like, I mean, I've, I've <laughs> seen so many couples where they worry about 
kid calls. I know, and, uh, that, I know, I know. That is that, that shouldn't be in the picture too much. So okay, so there there is a the thought process is okay. The thought process is the general thought process of people that are not having kids. Huh? Mm. I, mean, I don't have kids, but a lot of my friends that you know are doing decently well. You look at them, so easily they can get kids, right? But they instead they choose two big dogs, you know mm. that kind of thing, right? So so it's it's a trend. It's already a thing. More and more people are doing that, right? So the the thought process is. I grind so hard to get to where I am now. And with kids, I need to regrind. You, you know mm. what I mean? Right? So that is the general thought process of the people that choose a, a path this way. What what do you have to say to them? Like if you if you want to tell them you know, get kids, <laughs> how to reframe the thought process? What, what do you have to say? <laughs> the experience is it is very different, but you have a family and you build it. Yeah, it, it is true. You have to regrind everything, not just the money part. The emotional part even. Because mm. now your time is cut not only for yourself, but you have to cut time for family mm. differently. You need to commit to their upbringing and stuff. But in itself, always there's always pleasure after hardship, right? You know, you believe in that also. Mm. So you scale a mountain for what? Because you want to see the sun, Show right? Ah, see the sun, no? yeah, should, yeah, ah, yeah. Right. So you, you, you groom a kid, you, you grow a family. At the end, that's what brings a different meaning. A different depth to life mm, itself. Mm. So very philosophical. <laughs> not not trying to uh, rub anyone the wrong way. But then I think that that is a philosophical side of things, mm. right? Maybe you can try to help people find a little bit more comfort. Like you know, maybe it's not that hard. It's not that difficult mm. because I I also do hear the other side of the the argument where I have friends who like whether uh consciously or accidentally end up having kids. Uh, that's a different discussion, right? But but they end up having kids at a relatively young age. And as much as there are certain challenges that they mm. do go through, you know, like less time for like hang out, you know, mm. like, like these these young parents just disappear from groups on that because <laughs> they got no time. They're really very, very tight, you know. Uh, but they do recount that it's actually not that difficult, not as hard as how people, how they thought be, be, before even becoming a parent. I think it's a circle of friends that would shape out Mm. our perception of it right mm. so if you hang out with pro family people like me <laughs> I'll say that it's not that hard then if you hang out with a sibling who is against then maybe you buy that thought a little bit deeper mm. so in my experience I think it's it's worthwhile so hopefully that spreads that message pro Singapore <laughs> pro uh, family uh, uh, uh. in that sense yeah okay, so it's, okay. it's who, who you take influence for oh. will really shape your perception of how how tough it would be Okay, okay. But financially, how is it like like hmm. for as a young parent, you know, based on your experience and the people that you kind of talk to? A parent's money is the easiest to, yeah, to earn, right? I it's, know. You're actually a mummy fan. Right? You're going to see the mummy expo. Oh my God, it's crazy. Yeah. Yes, yes. So parents' money is the easiest because that desire to invest in your kids, whether it's tuition, whether it's enrichment, mm. piano, ballet, whatever case is, mm-hmm. seems like the easiest business yeah. you do go, yeah. go into parent-related uh, things for kids. Yeah. So in that space, yes, parents do invest in kids a bit to bring them up the right way, especially those who can afford. Mm. And I, I think most would feel that a lot of times it helps. Mm. So in that space, yeah, I do expect expenses to step up then come back on other areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's always priorities too. Like, you know, some parents, they mm. were like, all in, right? Of course, the people that can afford that is not within the discussion, right? They won't even consider this. It's the people that are kind of like stuck in the middle. So I can kind of afford, right? It's <laughs> like, I can afford sending my kids to like three enrich- enrichment class, uh. but by extension means no more holiday. Um. Or the holiday from Europe become Thailand or something like that, right? Mm. So it's the give and take people that we are talking to essentially, right? Not, not the people that are way in surplus and they can do all sorts of stuff. I guess the worry of bringing on another mouth to feed mm. usually is when a couple is not saving well. Maybe mm. we, can, we can define it. Yes. It's like, you know, if a couple is not saving and then they know these expenses will come on board, it's unavoidable. They will get worried. Where are we going to shave off something? Mm. So it doesn't really uh, mean that you need a certain level of income. To me, I think it means you need a certain level of saving. Mm. More important. So you can earning little, but you actually still have surplus. You can be very comfortable. This surplus, whatever I can do to the best for my kid, that's good enough. Okay. Yeah, so it's really defined by level of saving, mm. not level of income. Many assume, oh, I need X amount of yeah, yeah, thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If not, I'm not going to have kids. I delay it. No, it shouldn't be like that. Yeah. The worry comes because you are not saving. Mm. If you have little and yet you are saving a thousand, two thousand, you, you understand that is something you can cut out for mm. another month to feed. Okay, okay. So it's that simple. Focus on the saving element. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, okay, fair. And opti- essentially optimizing your expenses to get yes. to that, that surplus yes. position for a prolonged period to get yes. used to that, right? You have a surplus, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll be mentally mm. 
less stressed about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. And and I think this goes to even like people that are trying to invest. You know, mm. like when you first start, you think like, oh, every dollar needs to go in. But actually, you know, get yourself into a comfortable surplus situation. Then I think you deploy in a more uh, reasonable fashion, right? You're not as kanchiong, you're not as desperate, you know, not as uh, big swings. You know, it's just kind of like a bit more chill. Mm. I feel there's a tendency there, la, right? I, I'm not sure if you agree. agree, agree. But, okay, but as people make more money, they kind of move up this income ladder, you know, it's not just it's not just kids and, and investing, but there's also a big part on like taxes, right? Recently, mm. recently, <laughs> it's the season, uh, taxing season, right? And then you see the, the number like, like getting bigger, uh, right? Like, eh, eh, bigger is good. Yeah, yeah big eh, <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Bigger is not a bad thing, okay? Fundamentally, bigger is not a bad thing. But it's getting bigger. And I've heard chatter around amongst my friends. Of course, a lot of a lot of listeners are mm. similar. Like working professionals, they were like household income, 10, 20,000. You know, that, that, that type of mm. people are our audience, mm. right? So they will see their checks, you know, for taxes getting higher. Thank you for contributing to the <laughs> nation. This is important, you know. But from a financial professional, mm. you know, uh, how would you recommend I, optimizing? I would say that some are concerned about, because a lot of our tax relief ideas, like supplementary retirement scheme, SRS, topping up to CPF, of course, look out for the rules on when you can actually exercise them. These schemes require you to lock up monies for the long term. Of course, uh, there's mm. the trade-off. That's, That's the you, whole idea. What? Correct. Yeah, right? yeah. You, you save for retirement, you get a, cut off from your tax bill. Yeah, and on some level, you then reduce the probability of becoming a burden to society. <laughs> so society don't tax you now. <laughs> so, something <laughs> okay. of a logic there, but anyway, yeah, that's okay. my view. Yes. So back to the point, when someone gets to a higher income level, maybe mm. they've made that misconception when they were at a lower income level. Mm. They thought, hey, I parked this 8,000 in, but then my tax savings is only this few hundred. What's the point? Mm. But you realize when you get to a higher tax bracket, your savings could be in thousands already. Mm, your mm. 8,000 could be saving a, a few thousand already. Mm. And then that's where your, your misconception at the starting phase in your career may need to change. Mm. So relook at it. Relook at your tax bill. Understand, hey, you are jumping tax brackets. Mm. It's good. Mm. So your decision previously, don't let it shape what, what you can do today. Mm. So if you're at a higher tax bracket, I'm sure in your circle of friends, there are those that can suggest to you, SRS top up, CPS special account top up. Now the Medisave portion is included within it. Mm. So these are areas to optimize. Mm. And what you can save at a different tax bracket could be very different. Mm -hmm. and, and you had like a 90,000 tax relief. Mm. You know, what, what was in this <laughs> composite? Top up family, top up everyone so else. Th there's a max of 80,000 in terms of relief. Yes. On that point also, so for moms, working moms, maybe I can share also. When you have working mother's child relief, if you have a few kids, you're a high income mom, mm. you will realize you'll hit the 80,000 tax relief very easily. Very quickly, yeah. And make sure again, you have transferred the child relief to your other half. So that's something to note. Go and do all this tidying up, especially when you're earning lesser, these weren't a problem, but now these are left on the table. So another tip, go check on your own taxes, see whether you can optimize with your other half. And uh, back to the point of tax relief, 90,000. So the remaining came from donations. I'm a big advocate of donating. Rather rather than you know driving a flashy car, I, I pride myself as donating mm -hmm. bigger and bigger amounts as I develop in the career. Mm -hmm. So that amount can only come with donations and that's explaining how I got to 90,000 in reliefs. Why, why are you a big advocate? Maybe you can share... What is the top process? Yeah, rather than art, you know, upscale your atas car, you know, like like what? Why do you think this way? Uh, I I come from financial services industry. Mm. A lot of times we flex by flashy stuff. I was always thinking, is, is there a better way to express wealth? Mm. And I I advocate against you know flashy stuff any on the channel. So I realized, hey, actually donations while it brings on tax relief, you are actually proving to yourself you have surplus. I realized that and it was a happy for me. So, mm. eh, if I dare to give this money away, does that mean I have enough? It's different. When you buy a flashy car, you know you need to pay for it subsequently. Mm. Mm. It's different. You bought something expensive. The, the joy is momentarily. But now, you give this money away, you commit to it, and you realize, hey, I, I tell myself I have surplus. It's, it's a proof to yourself. You're not proving to anyone. You're proving to yourself. Mm. It's magical. You, know, you, you realize you can give thousands away. It means you, you know deep down, you touch out, you have enough. That's the best proof. Nice, nice. Ne never saw it that way, but I, I think that is good. 
Hey, welcome to the Financial Coconut Podcast Network. I'm your host, Reggie, aka Your Chief Financial Coconut. And if you are loving what we are creating here, like, share, subscribe, share with your loved ones, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, we'll see you for great content on Chill Swift TFC. What about managing money as a couple? Like, because you and your spouse as a family, you know, like, like, I think it's a it's a big problem for a lot of younger mm. couples, right? It's like, and it's it's very jittery. I know a lot of couples are trying to like set up family together. Mm. They've been dating for years, you know. Then you know it's like, hey, how are uh, how to do this? Mm. Uh? Then the classic answer is communicate. Very annoying one, right? <laughs> like, of course I know communicate. Of course I know balance enough, oh. right? Like, but. How do you do it? Like, what is your own way to, to kind of go But go my way may not be what the audience's of course, of way course. is, It's just correct. about sharing. Yeah, my your... wife happens to be someone who... Or anyway, if, if I'm in this space and I don't know what I'm doing, then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we have a problem already. Yeah. So, so let's assume that you are not too much in the finance, you listening in. The usual advice communicate, which we shouldn't touch on anymore. <laughs> um, I already attacked already, that's why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so the part of... Having maybe a joint account, maybe let's let's bring up that discussion. Mm, mm. Joint accounts have a lot of use. Mm. You are putting money in together for a joint goal, whether it's buying a new house, upgrading, retirement, kids' education. A, a joint fund is a, actually a communicating tool. Mm. Of course, we don't like communication, but you use that as a tool, but you see a dream together. So yes, I'll, I'll take yes. it a, a further step. You have a dream together. Hey, where do you want to get to? Because if you don't dream together, you're you're not walking the path together. Right? Mm. So mm. not only in, in fulfilling expenses, I would advocate to have joint accounts or joint retirement targets. Then mm. you walk the journey together. Mm. And at every milestone, you can measure mm. your journey, take pleasure in the journey walking, and then you hold each other accountable also. Mm. Maybe in that sense. So different families come from different situations. Accountability might be needed for different families. So mm. maybe that joint account can solve some problems. Okay. And, and to be clear, I'm not against communicating. I'm, mm. just communi- I'm just against using that as a big word to end all be all. Uh. But I like I like uh, the system that you've kind of set up. Maybe you could give me a little bit more color. Like, So we set up this joint account mm. together. Is it an equal contribution? Oh, need not be actually. Uh. Don't be too worried about it not being yeah, equal. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, we need to be sharing I, the things. I know, I know, I know. And actually, I answered this question uh, sometime back in a different setting. Like, when a couple uh, progresses in career, maybe at the start, all fresh grads draw roughly the same. Mm -hmm. So the difference is not big. We contribute the same. It's not not a problem. But you realize different careers have different big big bricks. Sometimes someone develops way faster through luck, through work, whatever whatever the case is, correct? Mm -hmm. And very soon you see, hey, one is double the other. Not that the other is half as clever. It's Mm not. It's just big breaks, you get lucky breaks, you you grow in different way. That change is difficult mm. for both to stomach. One with the bigger income might have different ambitions really. Mm. Uh, so again, uh, contributing equally m- shouldn't be a fixed method. You should grow that discussion. Again, we are communicating mm. because mm. we don't want to have uh, differences. Mm. It's very difficult to say, hey, you, it's not fair. Mm. Uh, so you, you need to use these settings and understand these things can evolve. 50-50 when we were early phase and 50-50 today may not work. Yeah, to be fair, fair is an arbitrary idea, yes. right? So yes. who is to determine how it's fair? Correct. I think at the end, it's between the, the couple, right? If mm. you all come together to build a family together, then as long as both of you are happy, you're good with this arrangement, mm. you know, and you can accept, actually accept, not just mm. like pacify, right? Correct. And then I think it's So it's, if one wants to leave to work, change work to a simpler job and mm. stuff, you know, you walk the journey means you accept. Mm. and you modify the contributions. Mm, mm. So there are difficult things to discuss as a couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's not just about just accept, right? Mm. It's, 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 it's that kind of rough discussion. It's yes. Like, so what does it mean? You know, who's going to do what then, blah, blah, blah. What has to go? And then a lot of those things, right? Correct. The compromises that will yeah, come yeah, when yeah. income drops mm. or when income rises, the, the perception is different also. Yeah, okay, okay, fair. Yeah, especially the income rise. Actually, the income rise one is quite underappreciated, mm. right? Because like what you said, the changing aspirations. When you have a big bump in your income, right? Your aspirations really change, right? They, they, they it's, it's just a very natural thing, right? And you want to share a little bit more about that? Like, how how will you kind of go through this process with your partner? Actually, there's a saying, you know, money reviews more of who we are. Uh, uh. And when you get big bumps in pay, you would you would feel that. Uh, it's mm. hard to describe. It's true, it's true. It's hard to yeah. describe. And when you get to a different income level, your friends are also at a different income level. The things you talk about Mm. affects your aspirations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's where growing as a couple needs to come together. Mm. If not, the 
divergence becomes big. Yeah. As yeah. a solo, maybe you can, yeah, you, you keep networking with different groups of friends. It's okay. But when you work in the family setting, you realize that hey, you need to grow together. Mm. So mm. the other one needs to keep pace mm. and also understand that, you know, it's it's a change that happens to everyone. But just for double confirm, uh, this joint account thing, is only one joint account or are we <laughs> looking at like multiple joint account? And like, uh, so, so in other words, you are on the ground of like, okay, we must have joint account for common... Uh, aspirations and common expenses and then we each have our own account is that kind of what you're thinking of I, I think the core message again is you know mm. develop that dream together mm. whether you want to have multiple sub accounts we know we know some banks now have some tiers yeah, we yeah, don't yeah, name yeah, names yeah, yeah. and they give you buckets <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 you, yeah. You, you play what fits you uh, uh, but again the dream I think the dream part is hard to sell mm. I spend more time thinking how to sell that dream it's just like you know when I bought this private property of mine I had to Tell my wife last time when we bought our first HDB, we said, hey, we will upgrade. Mm. I think it's a high second property. Don't rush there. 2011. Of mm. course, I was wrong for two years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Prices continue to go up. But I sold her the idea that hey, we will upgrade. Let's not buy something too ambitious now. Mm. So again, it's the dream. Then when the time comes, I need to execute. Like, mm. let, we make the dream happen. Mm. We move mm. our family to a different place. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So the dream setting, someone has to take a charge. Yeah, fair, fair. And to be clear, right, I think I think for a lot of you that wants to take the charge in selling the dream, okay? <laughs> Whoever, guy, girl, whatever, right? If you want to take charge in selling the dream, you must have a bit of patience. Uh. Mm. Like this selling process uh, is a few years, uh, mm. right? It takes a while and it takes a lot of conversation. And recently, I have quite a few friends that finally got their spouse to agree to like shift to Thailand together, mm. you know, or, or shift to, you know, like KL together. And I'm like, wow, congratulations, <laughs> right? Because that whole process, mm. you know, it, it takes multiple years to like one one layer by one layer, you peel it off and you kind of rebuild it. it. It's not so linear and, and mm. you have to be consistent at it. Like, you must believe in it. Fully agree. Yeah, Fully agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So, I think you, you share a lot. I love it. If you want more, you know, check out his channel. I think he has a lot of good stuff there on the channel. But in closing, right, if let's say today a young couple come to you, you know, and they have kids, right? So they have very young kids. Uh, and yeah, what what will you what 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 advice will you kind of give them if they want to you not know, be like a stupid parent, right? <laughs> like like what what beyond the parenting side of things, you know, like very young kids, just mm. just out, you know, they all the big and small but finances for kids. Like, do you have some thoughts you want to share? I think the first thing to listen to is what are their pain points? Mm. What exactly have they came to me mm, mm. as a key pain point? Mm. So that would lead. You know, are we not saving well? What is the real pain point? So different different young couples have different pain points now. If the pain point is we are not saving enough, mm. I then do a clear audit. Mm. Where are expenses going? Mm. Or are expectations to committing to kids uh, childcare enrichment mm. too excessive or not that's why there's not enough saving mm. as they're trying to save. so everybody's pain point is different and let's work on the pain point first but I guess one of the few key pain points would be we're not saving enough we don't know where to upgrade to mm. we don't have an aligned dream one wants to go here the other wants to stay put also seen before yeah. so communicating part also hey, uh, why should we move or why should we not move mm. uh, so again goals and dreams differ communication part although it, it's hard Hard yeah. to uh, say as a big stroke. But again, that that's where I would say a young couple needs to identify what the pain points. Okay. And from there, we can find solutions. Okay. Then if one, if I give you a more specific scenario, right? Where we as a young couple, we come to you and say, okay, we want to engineer financial success for our kids. Right? So they are very young and we want to make sure that by the time they grow up, <laughs> right? Settle already. Everything's sweet, sweet, right? And it's not that we are, we're not, we're not struggling. You know, like we're doing fine. We have surpluses to play around with. What should I do? Kids, sweet, sweet. That yeah, kids, is a, sweet, is a, sweet. It's yes. a nice dream to have. I think it's. Only, I think it's a dream for a lot of a lot of young parents. Yes. Yeah, especially the middle upper class working professionals, household income add together fifteen twenty thousand one. They really entertain these ideas. Like, so are they enough or not? Yeah. The two of them. I think two of them this, is enough. Two of them, two of them enough. Mm, yeah. So now it's like, more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they, you know, engineering like. Like true train program for the kid, like kid no need stress, you know. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's definitely a good mm. thing, but just putting out a scenario. Actually, on like, that point, kid no need stress, I kind of uh, disagree with the uh, part. Uh, 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 so it's like uh, if you interview Warren Buffett or whatever case is, they are not leaving too, too much for kids. Mm. On that train, I also don't contribute to kids' CPF. Mm. Uh, of course, some of the previous year's suggestions, hey, why not pump money to CPF? Yes. They can become millionaires in future. Yes. I kind of 
didn't go that direction. Oh. Uh, even though maybe I have enough, I donated yeah. away. Yeah. But also I think kids part is the letting them understand investing cannot be we spoon feed that. Mm. Maybe that's a different perspective. That's why I was reluctant to pump monies to them in a CPF setting whereby mm. it's guaranteed. I rather give them a capital and then they make mistakes and figure it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So on that front, uh, I'm not supportive of giving kids the entire ticket. Spend it on you know giving them the chance to make mistakes. Hopefully, mm. you'll deliver way better value. Nice. So essentially, just say no to uh, trust fund babies. Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Say no, no. no to trust fund babies. <laughs> Build yeah. it yourself. And woohoo! <laughs> okay. Thank you for your Can't time, Lovely. Check out his channel. I think he shared a lot of good stuff and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.